So this is a panel we're really excited about and we've been talking about for a while. It's titled, Which Numbers Athletes Love, Which Numbers Athletes Hate? And basically, it's baseball players turn broadcast analysts will explain how they use analytics to cover baseball from the booth. And we've got Manny Acta over in there. Manny's now an analyst for ESPN. He joined ESPN and ESPN Desportes in 2013. Manny had served as manager of the Indians, leading the Indians to a second place finish in 2011. Previously, he was manager of the Washington Nationals, the youngest active manager in MLB at the time of his hiring. Next to Manny, we've got Eduardo Perez, who's also an analyst now for ESPN. He's an analyst for ESPN's Baseball Tonight. He was the Astros bench coach in 2013 after serving two seasons as the Marlins hitting coach. And then we have, next to him, we have Kirk Goldsberry. Kirk is a staff writer for Grantland.com and was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis and assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Michigan State. Next to Kurt is Aaron Boone. Aaron's now an analyst for ESPN's Monday Night Baseball and is also on Baseball Tonight. And I think many in the room, and I know there are a lot of New Yorkers here, will remember Aaron for a home run that he once hit. <laughs> <laughs> and moderating the panel, we're very fortunate to have um, John Walsh. John is the executive vice president and executive editor at ESPN. Since joining ESPN in 1988, John's fingerprints are on many of the network's largest initiatives and launches. An executive vice president, Walsh has served as executive editor since December 1990 and oversaw the launch of ESPN the magazine and ESPN radio. John also serves as the chairman of ESPN's editorial board, and now I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is not an ESPN panel. This is an <laughs> analytics panel, so everybody knows. Uh, my goal here is to hopefully get a couple of laughs out of these people and cause some trouble. <laughs> so um, I, I, I've, I've cherished uh, the, the notion of this panel for years because I've uh, talked with uh, Mike McQuaid who actually does all of the, uh, oversees all the coverage of Major League Baseball and who is here. Um, but I've, I've uh, championed the use of whatever means possible so that we can abandon for at least a brief period of time the X and O business of whether, whatever sport it is and use something to give our audiences a different perspective on things. And I found over uh, my 27 years with the network that um, it's really difficult for uh, former players, former coaches, former managers to embrace and understand and utilize what numbers are for uh, and how they interpret. In the last, uh, it's my view, in the last uh, 25 years that the dynamics and the paradigms by which sports are owned and managed have changed dramatically. And part of that is that there have been people who come from diverse backgrounds with a different set of intelligence about how to interpret uh, econometrics as they relate to um, managing playing the game. So um, I'm going to start here with my buddy Aaron and just tell me how when you started off in this business, your new business as an analyst, um, you looked at numbers. Well, first, do I push, I'm sorry. Um, first coming in, my first year at the network was 2010. So sabermetrics, I guess, were starting to explode a little bit and late in my career, I started to become aware of, you know, certainly later in my career on base percentage and that whole money ball stuff started to make its way into the clubhouse. How did it do that? How, how did that happen? Well, I think the, the value for the first time in the 2000s and, and, you know, Barry Bonds, the value of on base percentage, I think started to resonate with all players. They understood that 
ooh, this was starting to become an important. Now, sabermetrics has since now and it is starting to explode as I've become an analyst. So I've understood the importance that I need to be able to wrap my head around this and to be able to have an opinion of what I think of it. And there's so many varying degrees of, I'm sure a lot of people in this room that are very passionate, that are one way about these metrics. And then there's guys I work with, players, that just will discard them completely. And um, I personally fall somewhere in the middle. I guess we'll eventually get into things that I really like. Um, I don't know if you want me to do that right away, but um, should, I, should I go down that road? Go, go wherever you want. <laughs> I'm a, all right, I'm, a, I'm gonna start out with, I'll, I'll start out with as a minor league player. Oh boy. Let me go to the restroom, I'll be back. <laughs> when, I, when I was first drafted and was in the minor league, so 1994, <laughs> five, six, 97, mid 90s, obviously you don't have a lot of video. Saber metrics, guys don't really know about it. You know, you know your batting average and those kind of things. But the first thing I would always look at when we would play a team, and maybe I haven't seen a pitcher before, and that was very commonplace. You probably haven't seen video on a particular pitcher. The first thing I would do as a hitter is walk to the stat sheet and look, and, and this could apply in a game when a reliever came into the game. I would look at the stat sheet, and I would look at his innings pitched, hits, walks, strikeouts. And right away as a hitter, that painted a picture to me of what kind of stuff this guy had. Mm -hmm. Now, I would watch, watch him warm up. Now let's say he was a high strikeout, let's say his numbers were really good, a lot of strikeouts, low hits to innings, and I watch him warm up and he wasn't overwhelming, didn't look like he was throwing mid-90s or anything like that. Now that, that painted the picture even further of saying, okay, this guy must, his trick pitch, there must be something about it that I need to respect more than what I'm looking at when I get up in that box. So, so that slider he's throwing that looks ordinary from the side um, probably isn't based on the numbers I just looked at on this stat sheet. That pitch is probably a little unique and, and has the ability to trick me. I need to take notice. So, so I guess whip is really the first thing I looked at as a player, as a hitter, and still to this day, um, you know, when I get in the booth or when I get on set and, and I'm talking about, say, a pitcher, if I don't have a lot of context on this guy, I haven't seen him a lot, he's a new guy, that will paint a picture for me right away is that walks, hits, innings pitched. So, Manny, when you were managing and you were in the game and numbers came in, what numbers did you look at as a manager? Uh, well, first of all, who knows how many kids I, you know, I, I didn't help in the minor leagues because uh, those numbers weren't available to me. I was introduced to Sabermetrics uh, in 2005 when I joined the Mets, and it was a clubhouse kid who actually came to me and brought up uh, a question. Uh, hey, Coach Acta, do you know that a guy on first base with no outs has a better chance to score if you let the guy swing the bat? that a guy on second base with one out after a sack bunt. I'm like, really, kid? Well, wh why don't you prove that to me? Well, I, I, I'm easy to convince. If you convince me, I can change it. And at that point, he convinced me. He brought up a bunch of stats, and he, uh, he gave me the, the money ball book, and he also gave me my favorite book, which is how um, – it's called Mind Game, how the Red Sox um, – Became, went from, 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 from being who they were to, to break the, the curse, basically. And, uh, and I started learning all that, and I was like, holy smoke, why have I been managing like Casey Stangel for so long? When, <laughs> you know, and uh, who knows how many kids down there I didn't let swing the bat or, or, or allow them to learn how to play the game. So I thought it was interesting for me. And when you use the word sabermetrics, a lot of people get scared because they just – it's just a word, and a lot of people don't want to be bunched up and, and pigeonholed into a bunch of geeks and all that kind of stuff. And, and what I do, it's... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. What I do, it's usually I always seen it as a common sense. 
that's how I see it. I mean, I do what I think it, it, it makes sense to me in baseball. So when, when I started managing, it was uh, three years later after I met that kid. I was far advanced in some things, and uh, it, it's, it's hard. It's tough because as a front office and as a manager or coach, uh, you do have to evaluate players differently that, than how they evaluate themselves. So putting a team together, putting a lineup together, that came in handy to me. Sometimes you just don't have the choices to have the guy on the top of the lineup with the good on-base percentage, but it really helped me. And uh, I have never backed down away from it. I do, I, I, I do use some of it. I don't use every, every little thing that it has come out out there, but um, I use it, and I think it has helped me. Uh, believe me, if you think that I have lost a lot of games in the big leagues, just imagine how many more I would have lost if I didn't know any of those numbers. <laughs> I think that helped me a great deal, and, and I think that's a stretch because of my record, but it has helped me. Eduardo, how have numbers affected the way you've looked at the game over the years? A dozen. It's all about chemistry, right, Vince? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a chemistry uh, comp. <laughs> well, you know, Aaron covered what we actually all did in the minor leagues. I think that's a very smart way, and I think the smart guys got to the big leagues because of that. Doing their homework, seeing all the video, and seeing the numbers, and being able to digest it with each one. But I'm gonna go to the coaching, to the coaching side when I was a hitting coach with the Marlins. And one thing I would look at is actually strikeouts per innings pitched. Uh, besides looking at their videos, see how nasty they are, see their tendencies early on. Because that stat, to me, really emphasized a lot what our approach was going to be that day. I have guys that look at, you know, try to get three, four pitches per at bat. They take a lot of pitches. Listen, this guy's not going to walk you. What he's going to do is strike you out. If you get to two strikes, the percentages go up. So that's when you change your, your entire, I invented this word so you can use it if you want, strategery, uh, to, to go out and... Figure how to get this guy early. What his tendencies are when there's nobody on base. Uh, he's going to try to strike you out. That's what he loves to do. If he has 30 strikeouts and 20 innings, guess what? Chances are you're going to go down. So let's get him early. And especially with the lineup at the time that I had with the Marlins, we had a lot of swing and miss guys. So I didn't want to get to that point. So you actually have to accommodate what you're going to do with your team depending on that pitcher on the mound. Now, going to last year where I had nothing to do with hitting, thank God, and had everything to do with defense, that all changes. The positioning, the shifting, I will not say it again, that word. I think it's been overused. I think it's just defensive positioning. It works. The numbers don't lie. Players are who they are and they're gonna always go back to the, who they are. Can they make adjustments? Absolutely, but not day in and day out uh, w with the field. If you're a dead pull hitter, you're gonna continue to be a dead pull hitter. A good case last year was Chris Young, one of the most notorious pull hitter right now in the game of baseball. You look at his charts, what are you gonna do? I'd rather play the first baseman over behind second baseman, have the pitcher cover, because this guy is gonna pull the ball every time. So there's, the sabermetrics and, and the way that the decision sciences department in Houston, uh, which Sig Megsdahl runs, and uh, Mike Fast, I love Mike Fast, by the way, great. But all these guys, they, what they do is they, they really make life actually easier. The numbers might scare you because you guys were all good in math, right? Okay, maybe not. PhDs, all. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, yeah, you are, sorry, right. well, uh, I got Harvard to my left. Spanish math. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> but at the same time, it's, it, it makes it easier when it comes to understanding it, and that's what the players nowadays, I think they have a lot of numbers thrown at them. They just have to pick which number is for them. All right, we're going to go to uh, Kirk, the uh, first PhD in geography panelist in the history of panels at sports <laughs> conventions. That's right. So um, uh, I mentioned what this panel was uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then you gave me your interpretation of why people don't embrace this. So I'd like you to share that uh, enthusiasm, uh, why people 
who have played the game and coached and managed the game don't share the enthusiasm that uh, other <laughs> people have for numbers. And so can you share your interpretation with everybody here? Sure. Um, so I mostly write about the NBA now for Grantland and ESPN. Um, but... Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm here. But Aaron, Aaron said painting a picture about three times in his opening remarks, and that's essentially what I do. And why do I do that? Because I think athletes and a lot of fans and a lot of human beings actually hate numbers. Um, and if they don't hate them, they don't like to see them encoded in ways that nerds traditionally encode them in, which are big spreadsheets or fancy algorithm, uh, Greek notation. Um, they prefer to understand the, the nature of a performer. That's why Aaron wanted to watch the guy warming up. That's why you look at the spray charts of the hitter. Um, and numbers in sports are their most powerful, in my opinion, when they're sort of helping us characterize the, the nature of a performer um, or a team. And right now, I don't think a lot of advanced analytics, quote unquote, do a good job of simply landing that plane, helping, helping the analyst communicate with the player, hey, this is what this guy does a lot. Um, so I started working with basketball data, just saying, how is Kobe Bryant different than Kevin Durant? Uh, and visualizing the data. And uh, I, have a, I have a chart that I was hoping Robert in the back was going to help me uh, put up. But I use the term tricking people into looking at numbers a lot. Um, and, and that's one thing I think visualization can help us do, both for broadcasting and for communicating with athletes at, at any levels. Um, heat charts, spray charts, these kinds of things I think are alternate ways of encoding data or information that are more intuitive to athletes or performers, especially if there's things like language barriers involved. So um, hopefully we'll see a chart here in a minute and you'll see what I'm talking about. But I think we're all passionate about numbers, John, if they help us understand a performer. So this is just all the four seam fastballs thrown in Major League Baseball last year. And I'm sorry that that's not showing up very well. Um, but it's the spatial nature of where the pitches go, just helping people understand who does what, um, how is this pitcher going to attack you? Uh, Robert, there's one with Liriano um, in a specific pitch. Yeah, that one. So where is this guy throwing this amazing pitch against left-handed hitters? So if you're a left-handed batter and you have to face Francisco Liriano, um, you're in trouble, first of all. Second of all, um, here's what he's gonna try to do, probably. At a glance, that's actually about you know, 600 numbers encoded in one chart. So as opposed to showing that into a big spreadsheet form, we're showing that as a chart, and people can sort of consume the information much quicker. Manny, would something like this ever work in a clubhouse? It's already there. It does, and it's always there, but uh, it, you, need to, you need to find enough people that, that embrace uh, that, type of, uh, uh, that type of chart and, and, and those type of numbers. And it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier here about chemistry. I mean, when you have good chemistry, you have more guys that care about that. And I totally agree with what Vince was saying earlier about chemistry. Winning helps more chemistry than chemistry helps uh, winning. Uh, and uh, the issue with that is that nowadays a lot of teams are making the mistake of taking too many chances on, on very good athletes that might play well and not a guy who has a, a high character. I know we all can't have 25 uh, Boy Scouts, but um, I mean, you can't have that many guys that don't have good characters. And, and, and a lot of teams nowadays just underestimate that. But this would, would usually work on the left side of the screen that uh, Vince had earlier about team with good chemistry. Guys will show more interest into looking at this. I was. Fortunate enough to work for the Cleveland Indians, one of the most, uh, uh, I mean, these people are off the charts when it comes down to mm -hmm. statistical analysis. And, and you know, I, I learned so much over there. And my last year over there, we really attacked the, the shifting over there. And because we had a lot of guys that had good, uh, good character over there, we tackled that. And, you know, you could see the difference uh, throughout the season. But... Again, when you have people that don't have high character, they're just going to look at that and go, hey, man, I don't care about that. All I care is about throwing hard and hitting the ball. And that's it. And that, that's how it works. P piggybacking on that a little bit, in talking about good character, the Boston Red Sox, winners of the World Series this year, were 
got famous a little bit for their good character this year. They went out and revamped their their roster a little bit, had had the ability to reset, and brought in good character guys, obviously good players as well. I mean, that's important. But these a lot of these guys were considered, um, you know, veteran players, grinders, and I guarantee you whether they knew it or not, whether they were fully embracing Sabre metrics or different numbers, I guarantee you conversations about Liriano and that pitch was talked about when those guys were at the ballpark earlier than a lot of us every day because they were famous for dialogue and conversation and what was going to unfold that night. And I guarantee you a lot of these numbers put into charts and that like looking at that, that's, that's easy for me as a dumb player to understand. And, and I can understand, okay, guys, we got Liriano going tonight. This is what's dominant for him. How are we going to go about approaching this guy? And I think the Red Sox were masterful at that this year. Well, there's a theory in, uh, in uh, all of sports now with uh, the movement of uh, analytics called the QEE theory. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. I'll explain it and then ask you to uh, comment on it. And it's called Quant Eyes and Ears. And it is to kind of put in perspective what quantitative numbers mean. So if you have a pie of 100% and quantitative data is one aspect, eyes, which are video and scouts views of a player are another perspective, and ears, which are um, the kind of character issue that you're talking about, Aaron, which is uh, uh, what, what kind of a person is this in the clubhouse, or what kind of uh, uh, issues this, uh, player might have had over the past however many years, uh, what, what's, what's been written about him, what's personal life like, et cetera. There is a, a body of opinion now that um, this QEE theory, which is applied by some teams in some sports, uh, and they say it has kind of minimized or diminished the importance of quantitative analysis. So if quants were 80%, quants are now 63%. So if you had a pie of 100%, what, would, what piece of that would be quantitative? What piece of that would be um, scouts and video? And what piece of that would be character? Do um, you want to start, Eduardo? Uh, the <laughs> apple part? <laughs> <laughs> I would, well, you started with me, huh? Uh, I did. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you're, you're a Columbia boy, so you're, you're right here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, st I'm stumped on it because I was thinking about it, to be honest with you, and I'm, I'm looking at the Harvard guy to my left going, what would, he, what would he start with? But I would probably go with the quantitative part, and, and I'd probably give it, I think, equal parts. I think yeah. numbers are for, for each person different, and that's one thing we have to... Uh, we have to. I was talking to Manny earlier about it. I said each player is different, each role is different, and we can't evaluate each player or or, or the team itself with uh, if it's the the eyes part of the scouting, if it's the the quantitative part because a lot of numbers also lie to you just like what you see lies to you, and you really have to look beyond that. And I don't know if there's a right way of answering it. There's an opinion to it, but. I'm, I'm stumped on your question, and I really do not want to answer it completely yet. I'm, I'm a little stumped, too, but I, I will try and say it in this way. I am fascinated now, as much as I am anything in the game, with teams putting these, this puzzle together. Um, not every team, obviously, is able to spend on a giant core of Man, I've got Troy Tulowitzki at short, so on and so forth at every position. So I look at a team like Oakland, who I've had, who I've got to cover in the postseason the last couple of seasons, and I've, I marvel at how important and the value that they've been able to find between the six, say the sixth most important player on the roster to the 25th most important player on the roster, and and how they've been able to, in short spurts or in certain matchups, really be able to make that 25th guy really important to what they are doing. Um, 
I think Tampa's done great at it. Now, obviously, these teams have good pitching, so if you don't have good pitching, it probably doesn't matter anyway. But with all this information we have available to us, to be able to – and if you don't have unlimited funds like most teams or certainly like a lot of teams don't, but to be able to take three guys and fill two positions and – have a manager that is in tune with the front office to where I know how to match up each and every day to have this guy that handles this sinker baller that's going to have a decent chance to succeed tonight. He's my left fielder tonight. I know this other guy I've got, not necessarily a straight right left platoon, but what type of pitchers this guy has a chance to be successful against. And for some guy, it may be 400 at bat. Some guys, it may be 200. And in that, you have one dynamic player. I think that's one of the more fascinating things going on nowadays. And I think the teams that are really good at that, are, are we're seeing them have a lot of success without necessarily having a lot of dollars. Uh, we live in a world of sensationalism. And uh, I congratulate Mark on... Uh, the agenda for this is which numbers players hate, which players, uh, which numbers players love. So um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't get to uh, that headline. So <laughs> let's start with, uh, we'll, in, we'll uh, conclude a little bit later here with what numbers you love, but what number do you look at and you say that's meaningless? What number do you say, you know what, I'll discard that, it doesn't mean anything to me. And I'm gonna start with uh, Manny since you had to make these judgments on a daily basis managing two major league teams? Well, I'll speak uh, overall, not only from my standpoint, but from the player standpoint. Uh, uh, first of all, the reason why players hate the new numbers are because they have either a minus at the beginning <laughs> or a zero. <laughs> and anything that has a minus or a zero in front, players hate. Because even if a guy is just a so-so player who hits 260 with seven home runs and 53 RBIs, that looks better than if you tell him you have a minus two war. <laughs> and so any one of those numbers, they hate it. That's not our job. We have to go about you know, <laughs> evaluating them. It, 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 uh, to me, I, I take a look at a lot of them, and, and, and I don't trust every single one of them. I'm still not buying the, the UZR 100%. Uh, when I was managing, I always went by defense efficiency because I thought that uh, with uh, good positioning, I could control that a little bit. I, I kind of, uh, it threw me off a little bit how one year my shortstop in Cleveland wasn't good enough to play short. We had to move into third. Then he ended up playing shortstop in another team the next year. Then two years later, he's got a better wrench. That my guy, I sure that we moved them because of him. And, uh, and there are a lot of those things that I, I'd rather see him on an everyday basis. Like no one had to tell me that Cliff Pennington had better wrench than a few of the guys that I had in the past, but I'd rather have the guy that I had because he would catch everything right at him and make the play. So there are some statistics that I just look at him and uh, push him away. Uh, but from the player standpoint and us, I mean, players like the good old traditional. That's mm -hmm. what they like, okay? They like RBIs. I was talking to Eduardo earlier about his dad. He loves RBIs. But how am I going to sit Tony Perez next to me and tell him, Tony, you drove in 100 runs, but 20 of those 100 runs, you broke your bat and hit a ground ball to second with the infield back and a run in a third. You know, I mean, <laughs> come on now. Or, or uh, the guy sometimes didn't understand when I was in the dugout and you have a second and third with no outs. And a guy flail at the first pitch, low on the way, hits a lazy fly ball to left field, to drive in a run, and everybody is like high-fiving the guy, and I'm, I'm fuming in the dugout. <laughs> I'm like, he didn't do anything good. He should have hit the ball to the right side so he can drive one in and move the other one over to third with less than two outs. But those are the part of things that, that comes to our job. How do you sit down a player and say, you know what? Be quiet. You know, you drove an 80 runs, 15 of them were, I could have driven those runs in. <laughs> I could have break my bat and hit a ground ball up the middle. And, and we see that on every single day because, listen, 
The guy who gets on base, who works a walk or gets a single, then goes from first to third on a bullet to right. Then this guy flails a, a, a short fly ball and the guy doesn't score from third and he's mad because he didn't get him an RBI. And when he gets the RBI with the little short fly ball, everybody is shaking his hand and everybody forgets about the guy who walked or got a single or went from first to third and ended up scoring the run, which I think is the most important thing in the game. So that's a big balance for us. So there are some statistics that you don't want to tell the player, hey, I really could care less about this, you know, because that's the one that he really, he really likes. They like batting average. They want air run average. I mean, that's their favorite for the majority of the pitchers because they can come in, allow three runners that they, that they found on bases, mm -hmm. allow them in, uh, two doubles, and then they get three guys out and they have a 0, zero, zero ERA. You know, they like those, but we don't look at those. And, uh, and on the other hand, I think pitchers nowadays, not everyone is like Brian Bannister, who's going to be here later on, but some pitchers are grasping that a little bit more. They like the whip because it's a little bit simple for them, which, you know, hey, if you create a lot of traffic, chances are you're going to give up some runs. So a lot of them are gravitating toward the ERA to the whip, and uh, sooner or later they're going to find themselves on the right side. Can I add to that real quick, John? Um, a lot of players, they don't like looking at numbers, and a lot of coaches don't like the players looking at the numbers uh, because then it takes them away from their game, their strength. They start worrying, they start looking at the board, they start looking at the pamphlets that are in the clubhouse or even the internet, looking to see what their numbers are. And if they don't know who they are, those numbers can really bury them. And uh, case in point, if I have a cleanup hitter and he's worried about his on-base percentage, something's wrong. My cleanup hitter can't steal bases, he can't go first to third easily on a base hit. You, have, you, have, you need a triple to move him to third. I mean, there's just, it depends on who you are and who you want your, your team and your player to be. And you alluded to my dad. My dad always told me, I remember in 1990, he came up to me and he goes, hey, Eduardo. I'll do it with his accent because it's the only way I remember the story. <laughs> um, he, and he, t he always speaks baseball in English to me, so this is, this is actual. He, he, t he told me, he goes, hey, you know that the top five guy in the Hall of Fame are in the, uh, no, he goes, the top five guys in strikeouts, I'm in there. And the other four are in the Hall of Fame. So eventually he made it to the Hall of Fame 10 years later. But what I'm getting to is strikeouts isn't really a bad thing if you know when to strike out. You can have a lot of strikeouts. You don't want to strike out with a runner in scoring position. That's one thing he always told me. You hit the ball to right center. That's the way you get an RBI. You talk to my dad about whip, he'll go, who do you want me to whip? Who's asked you want me to whip? <laughs> because that's what he'll, you know, that's what he'll ask. But that's, old, that's what old school wants. I'm sorry, kid. But so, <laughs> so Aaron, what did your dad and your grandfather tell you at home? With the accent. <laughs> drive those runs in, son. I always wanted to drive them in. Um, we're on skeptical. Go ahead. Skeptical. I, I guess I'm still a little skeptical um, of the defensive metrics. Um, I want to know about them when I go into a game. Um, I guess I place them in my own context and I look at them and I do what I want with them. Uh, it, it varies. Um, one of the things that drives me nuts, drives me nuts, and I'll get this in my packet for a Monday night game, it may be talking about a first baseman's range these guys got outstanding range at first. And I'm thinking, well, it's probably because he's going to steal the ball he should be going to cover the first base on that the second baseman had, so he's just not used to playing the position a lot. So I hate that number. Um, I tend to like range from my outfielders and center fielders, and I, getting back to Boston, having Ellsbury and Victorino, what that was able to do in that ballpark and what I think potentially happens with the Yankees, with Ellsbury and Gardner in that ballpark in a bigger left field, I think those things have a chance to impact you over the course of the season in a big way. I'm really big on, I agree with Matt, Manny, I don't know exa if, if exactly what you're saying, but knowing that my infielder is going to catch the ball, because I agree, I think positioning 
and especially what we've seen now with the way defensive position themselves and playing two trends can mask a lot of lack of range, so to speak. Therefore, I want my guy to be reliable, to catch the ball. Um, I see some of these shifts now, and I think it is an awesome thing. I, I'll be in the booth, and some guy will be like, why, why are they doing that? And, and the once in a while, when a hit goes through the vacated spot, I, I'm just thinking, man, as a hitter, the few times in my career, because all these shifts weren't prevalent, but the few times in my career I remember St. Louis, Tony La Russa used to stick the second baseman over the second base bag, and I'd hit a ball that I'd think it was a hit, and it used to make me so mad. And I think <laughs> now, if I had to play against some of those shifts, man, I'd, I'd make even more outs than I made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what numbers, uh, Kirk, can, from your experience, um, how are numbers, what's the feedback you get from the numbers that you put out? Well, I mean, I do a lot of basketball stuff, and there's a lot of similar stuff going on. There's a good story this year about Rudy Gay when he's playing for the Raptors. He banned stats from the Raptors locker room, those little stat sheets they get in the NBA after the game. He banned them. Uh, and the analytical community was up in arms. And um, it made me think of some of the stuff that Manny was saying. There's a time and a place for numbers, first of all, in an organization. And I think a good sign of an organization in any domain, whether it's sports or something else, is knowing when to employ the numbers, knowing, knowing when to bring numbers to an employee and knowing when to, to talk to them in other terms. Um, in some cases, they're really good proxies for performance. Uh, you know, strikeouts or hits or whatever might be the, uh, the tool you need for that job that day in that conversation. Um, but many times they're misused and I think, or overused. Um, and so sometimes it's useful not to think about which numbers are working, but how much numbers you need in your organization, how much quant should be in that communication. Um, and I also think it's, it's useful uh, and it's really interesting to hear uh, these guys' perspective on it because, you know, when I talk to NBA teams, I'm always saying, you know, the directives have to come from the basketball experts, not the number experts. There has to be a clean research question for the numerical guys, the quant guys, to answer and give a clean result that then can what's be a, What's a good, clean question? What is Francisco Liriano going to do tonight? Okay. Right? Okay. I, I think. I'm not a baseball guy, but that seems like something that a manager might ask the, the, the staff. Hey, give us, you have two minutes with the team, give us the breakdown of what this guy does, how he does it, when he does it. Okay, that can lead to um, Aaron's uh, favorite here. I'll start with you, Aaron. Is uh, What numbers have you in your analytical phase now embraced and like a lot. Hmm. There it comes, no. <laughs> um, I, like, I like the war when I'm looking and comparing um, positions. I don't necessarily like it when we just throw it up as a blanket, this guy leads in war. I like it when I'm comparing other people in his positions. I like FIP <laughs> for predicting what a pitcher might do going forward. And I like BABIP. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Um, there I, it I do is. like BABIP for a young pitcher maybe that I don't know a lot about. To help me, is, is this guy going to be able to repeat it? As a guideline, like, okay, I, the jury's out for me on this particular pitcher. And that for me, I look at that feel like, can sway me a little bit to think, okay, yes, he, he has the ability to maybe repeat this or that was for real. Um, I, I guess those are what I like. And what I'm really getting interested in is this catcher framing business. I grew up in a catcher's house. My, my dad was a great defensive catcher and I heard my entire life, we talked receiving and catching and pitch framing and that was such an important part of who he was. And now I've talked to a couple people even this spring in how prevalent that's becoming and the, how they're able to measure that. And one, uh, one of the things that I, I read this morning, uh, there's a, an article that was on Grantland where uh, Kirk works and it's published by ESPN.com on picture framing. And it said that Jose Molina was worth 111 runs a year. Yeah. And, and it's a pretty good number. 
Absolutely, and, and now we're seeing Jose Molina get, continue to get these deals, and now we see a guy like Ryan Hannigan coming off a year where he struggled offensively, I know had some injuries, but known as a pitch framer. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, are, that the Rays go out and give him a two-year deal because I think the Rays, a team that's been ahead of the curve, views him as very valuable with a great pitching staff, obviously, and his ability to – to steal strikes, so to speak. And that's um, something that I think there are these, some of these analytics are going that I find very interesting. And I think is a very, perhaps as big a, big a job of the catcher as anything. I think we make too much sometimes of ability to throw and this guy. For me, it's about, does, does he get strikes? Does he receive the ball well night in and night out? And I think that is the number one measure of a great catcher. So Steve Carlton should thank your dad for uh, all those wins. That's right. Um, Eduardo, what numbers do you love? There's one that really stuck out in my mind, especially with the Astros, uh, because it's, it's very sabermetric, that organization, with the Decision Sciences Department, and it's actually the Babbitt Plus. And that's what I was getting at is that with Aaron earlier. I was talking to him about the velocity, you know, the velocity of the ball off the bat with off each hitter when it comes to putting that ball in play. What velo does it have? Because it, it changes everything to me. It could be a lot of luck, but, and then it could be a lot of defensive positioning. But when you add uh, the velocity coming off the bat of a hitter, now you're going, wait a second, this could be consistent year, th year out through year out because he's not just getting lucky. It's harder to defend the velocity of the ball getting through that infield it's harder for a guy to catch the ball, and that's where then he gets upset that his shortstop now can't play short and has to play third because, you know, the, the velo changes. That's one thing that won't change year in and year out, that velocity off that power hitter or off that line drive hitter. Manny? I, I first started with the BP, Baseball Prospectus, so I was a big fan of uh, value over replacement player, but it was um, – based on, on offense alone with the position players. And uh, so now I, I gravitated toward the war, basically because uh, it includes everything and it can put to rest the, the question about who's the best player. And, you know, I, it has given me a lot of arguments over the last few years because, you know, people still think that the best player is the best hitter, and it's not. Uh, just because a guy is the best hitter, that doesn't mean he's the best player. So. War puts that to rest a little bit. I'm a big fan of the whip. I mean, it's a, it, it's a simple formula, and, and also it tells you, I mean, it's, there's nothing to it. Traffic on the bases equals uh, runs. Uh, I'm also with the guys, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with the Babbitt, and uh, I don't use the word luck in my vocabulary at, at all, but uh, it, it gives you a good idea of how a guy is gonna come down to earth again next year or how, you know, this guy might pop up next year and do better because uh, we have a formula and we have a number where, you know, you cannot be with a 390 Babbitt if you're just a so-so hitter and, uh, and, and expect to repeat that. So um, it's used a lot when you're acquiring players. Uh, we had a case a couple of years ago when I was in Cleveland. We had uh, Casey Kochman who was coming from – from Tampa, and uh, obviously they have the artificial turf over there, and K uh, Casey's not as fast as, as me, basically. I mean, he's, he, he didn't leg out too many base hits. And, and we were pretty clear that his batting average over there was affected by that, but we were hoping that he was going to come down and still be productive for us. So those things, uh, I think uh, I like it and, and give us a better idea not only – on the hitter side, but also on the pitching side. When, uh, when a guy's being banged around, depending on his stuff, I mean, you see some guys like uh, the Masterson and, and the Verlander and those guys that are tough to square up. I mean, you have a better idea on those guys, but when it comes down to guys that just have command and, and their stuff is not as good, then you can, you can make some quick decisions and, and, and expect um, uh, things more clearly. So a regression to the mean means something in the, in the clubhouse. Um, <laughs> 
We, 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 we're uh, winding down here, and I want to give the audience an opportunity to uh, ask these uh, gentlemen whatever you want to ask them. So we have a, a couple of microphones up, so if you would uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll find you, and you can ask a question. I would ask that uh, you uh, use your name and whatever affiliation you'd like to uh, um, take uh, accounting of, and uh, ask whatever you want. So let's go to some questions here. Hello, Ed Schaefer. Uh, I work for EMC, and I'm part of our big data analytics um, consulting practice, but long-time statistical guy, and most of my childhood was spent you know, doing box scores of baseball games and now blog and, um, for one of the NBA teams. But I was really curious about some of the debate the last couple seasons, um, like a Cabrera versus... Um, you know, the sensation in, in, in Anaheim um, in terms of who's really an MVP. And you can even extend that to, um, a, you know, a starting pitcher versus a, an everyday player. It's my contention that I feel like we, we don't value enough um, the defensive side of the statistical game. Um, my, I think Trout was, was outstanding defensively. Cabrera was, was, out, was more outstanding offensively, but both, you know, it's kind of like semantics as to what you evaluate. But, is there kind of a general consensus on the panel as to, you know, whether or not defensive statistics are undervalued or if advanced analytics might, you know, contribute to a better kind of holistic view of who really is an MVP? And, and then how do you also look at that relative to starting pitcher versus everyday player? I'm going to take that. Let's take that. You want me to? Um, I can say playing that I always viewed having a great defensive center fielder and I mean game-changing. So there are a handful. When I was playing, Andrew Jones, Mike Cameron, Jim Edmonds, a handful of guys that were great center fielders that I feel like affected the game once a week. It just seemed like they caught a ball that the other three quarters of the center fielders didn't go get. And I thought there was just tremendous value in that. So I think when you play a premium defensive position, and you're great at it. Um, I think that is probably undervalued in, in our game today. And, and certainly Mike Trout uh, is that guy. I, I think I would have personally, not that I vote, but I, I thought Miguel Cabrera was the MVP. But if you ask me who I think the best player is, I think it's Mike Trout. And his ability on the defensive side affects things as much. Where I think some of these things missed, though, is like my National League MVP last year would have been Yadier Molina. I think his effect on the game, night in and night out, on things we can't necessarily quantify from a war standpoint, um, he would have been my guy, period. All right, let's, well, get, to the, uh, let's get to the next question. I want to uh, try and have one person answer each question if we can all right. so we get more questions in. Hi, uh, Richard Bergstrom, ESPN Sweet Spot Network. Um, pretty much everyone talked about how they like the war, but they weren't sure about the defensive metrics. So how do you explain that to an audience and, and to yourselves? Kirk, you want to try to take that? Well, I, I made an effort earlier. Um, <laughs> it's just they have different ones. And to me, with all the shiftings and, uh, and, and, and you know, it's just very tough to, uh, to explain to an audience itself how are you measuring this guy's range on an everyday basis? What are you doing? Are you just picking, uh, let's say, a, a portion of the field? What about when you play a, a team that has four or five guys that were shifting? And mm -hmm. it, it's just very, very, very difficult. As a manager, I, I like to trust my eyes when it comes to that. I mean, I... I I see the metrics, I read them, I study them, and all that, and I'll go for some of it. When it but when it comes down to players that I see on an everyday basis, I like to trust my eyes better. Also, that's a great thing about sabermetrics and analytics that it shows you a lot of things that you can't see with the naked eyes. But um, that's very, very, very tough to create, and that's why you find two out of the three of us uh, having doubts on the defensive metrics. Now, can, I'm going to add on to that real quick. Last year, as I, I was the one that was moving the defense in, in Houston, Matt Dominguez came up to me and goes, hey, dude, I'm leading the league in defensive matrix. And he's like, I'm like, 
really, in third base? He's like, yeah. He goes, what they don't know is they're saying that I have the best range. But what they didn't know was he never played the line. He always played in the 5-6 hole. So he was always away from the, where the regular third baseman plays in the positioning. And that actually gave him, through the metrics, they're looking at a standard. They're saying he's got great range to his left. So what, did you, think, was, what did you think then, Eduardo, of, of uh, the number of balls that went down the line? The, what, what the if, you look, if you look at the numbers with the, defense, uh, with the decision sciences, it's greater number going in the 5-6 hole than it is going down the line. How much greater? Uh, actually, it's 90-10. That's yeah. one of the, That's I, I learned that through, uh, through an article that came out on ESPN, the magazine, mm -hmm. a few years ago when I was in Montreal. Thank and you for, for the commercial. <laughs> this is not an ESPN panel. From, <laughs> need to erase my... Uh, from that day on, uh, as a manager, I will never play the line completely. Like, he sickens me when I see a guy literally stepping on the line, guarding the line, when I know that 90% of the balls are going to go right at the guy or to his left to his and only 10%. Why wouldn't you want to play the 10%, uh, the, the 90%? Because everybody's afraid that if one ball rolls over there, you're going to have to answer a few questions. Why aren't you guarding the line? And that happened, that happened last <laughs> and, year. And, it happened and, last and year against happens. the Angels. But uh, I, I think that's the reason why, mm -hmm. I mean, he does it. And, hey, why not just go with the, with the facts and the percentages? I mean, uh, that, that's the way... That's the way uh, it should be to me. Next question. Uh, Drew Forte, student at Elon University. Um, I guess continue the defensive metrics, and obviously that's probably where the next breakthrough is. And uh, just came out about the player tracking. Um, you know, and now there's a system they can track players. And maybe, Kurt, you could talk about basketball. It's a big thing now that where they've brought in the sports VU of tracking the players and how maybe that could be used, you know, in baseball to kind of better determine defensive metrics, what we've seen in basketball. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Eduardo just answered it for me. It's hard. Um, <laughs> but it's not only hard, it's, uh, pardon the expression, it's a shitload of information, it's a shitload of data, and there's only a very few valuable nuggets in there. And that's where it becomes more and more important as an organization to come up with the clean questions about what you want to extract from there, because it's going to be a pain in the rear end to get anything out of there. Um, so if you're trying to figure out who is good at defense in baseball, you have to formalize your question with the baseball experts. The data experts need to work hand in hand with these guys. What makes that guy, what do you want to see from that third baseman if he's starting in the 5-6 hole? What are we looking for in the data? Don't just turn the data guy out there and say, find out if this is a good third baseman, because he'll probably, or she'll probably make a lot of mistakes without knowing what the baseball intelligence is, what the, what the right research question is. So these big data questions uh, really depend on formalizing the process at the get-go with the uh, domain experts. All on the quality of the question. Next question. Uh, I'm Neil Traven, uh, longtime Sabre member. Uh, interested in data analysis, but I keep on watching other people do it instead. Uh, we, we're talking about defensive metrics. In most cases, the advanced metrics pretty much track with what the impression is. You know, Mike Cameron had great numbers as well as being a great, looking like a great center fielder. But there are a few cases of people who have very good defensive reputations whose numbers are awful. And I won't mention Derek Jeter or Ken Griffey or Kirby Puckett, but <laughs> you might think of people like that. What, how can you explain that sort of phenomenon? The offense outweighs the defense. <laughs> That's what it comes yeah. down to. I mean, you have to defend and you have to make sure that they do not score, but at the same time, you gotta put numbers up on. And these guys, the three that you've mentioned, you know, rest in peace, Kirby, but these guys offensively, they change the game. They're game changers. Yeah. And that definitely outweighs every part of the defensive part. And as long as they can catch the ball in their vicinity where they're at and they're positioned well, that's all what managers want. And he said it earlier, catch the ball. If you're going to be there, if it hits your right or left and you don't catch it, so be it. All right, one more question. Also, beware of the sports center phenomenon, which is 
the guy who makes oh, stop it. The guy who makes the great interception in football is going to make make the uh, make the uh, the highlight package. Or a guy who makes a diving catch in center field. Um, but the guy who does kind of what he's supposed to do 99% of the time might not make it. So for either Manny or Eduardo, um, what would you say is the perception of statistics for Hispanic players coming over to the majors? I actually asked um, Alejandro Diaz today, and I asked, I was with the White Sox, and I asked the Latin players, what's, what's the best, what's your favorite number uh, to look at? And they kept it simple, average. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't go with on-base percentage. Uh, Diaz went with average. I was like trying to explain to him, well, you're a leadoff hitter. It should be on-base percentage. It's average because at the end of the day, people ask you and, you know, they ask, hey, what'd you hit? How many home runs you hit? They keep it old school. They keep mm -hmm. it simple. Uh, and it's the organization's job, actually, to then educate them as far as they go and, and they see it. But in the Latin community, I say it's average. Well, we're definitely behind. Uh, we're behind because we, we have a lot of other things to worry about. First, you, you have to learn how to say water before somebody try to teach you how to say on base percentage. So, uh, so we're behind. I mean, let, let's, let, let's be honest. We're, we're behind. Yeah. That's it. We're, we're behind, and uh, like Eduardo said, those guys, all they care is about batting average. And um, um, the, 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 the all you can't walk off the island thing, I mean, uh, hey, no one gets picked in a tryout to sign a contract for looking at a BP fastball or taking pitches. And, and it, takes them, it takes them a while. We do have a few guys that they have that knack for uh, taking pitches like Ortiz and back in the days a little bit, D'Angelo Jimenez and some of those guys that come to mind. But the majority of them, I mean, you have to break it down like uh, Eduardo was talking about Diaza. I mean, some of the guys nowadays... Uh, when it's to their convenience, are looking at on base percentage. If a guy can't hit, but he walks a lot, oh, he likes LBP. He would always point that out to you. I mean, it, it, it is getting better, but when it comes to the <laughs> Spanish side, we're behind, but it's because we have a lot of other things to worry about than, than learning how to say uh, winning above replacement. <laughs> I'm proud to say these are my colleagues at ESPN. Thank you, Manny, Eduardo, Aaron. And thank you all for your questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you see the drop tonight. <laughs>